Good morning to group members here and around the world. I've learned that when I pray for other people, asking the Lord to help them with their sicknesses and other problems, my own problems don't seem so much anymore. It might be good for our faithful members to go through the member list for the Sunday School group, pick a person from a state or country different from yours, send that member a friend request, and begin actively praying for them. Reach out by messenger and tell them how you're praying for them and ask them to do the same for you. And then when you have an opportunity, let me know how it goes. Now this week, we're going to look at David the Giant Killer. We can only imagine the look of shock on the king's face. This teenager was brave enough to step onto the battlefield against a giant who had been a warrior all his life. Saul may have been trying to protect his friend David, or he may have been considering how he could save face in this terrible situation. Stick with me and learn the deep spiritual truths embedded in this epic of all battles. In the life of David, we see the picture of an unexpected warrior. David defeated a seemingly unbeatable enemy with courageous faith in God's power. This is a picture of Jesus, the greater warrior, whom no one expected to win the victory over sin and death. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, God is mighty to save. Because we've been forgiven through the power of the cross, we pursue the nations, not in judgment, but with the message of grace that all may hear the good news and be swept up into the glorious love and grace of God. God often wins the victory through unlikely heroes. This is so that all glory and honor and praise goes to him, for it is he who is indeed the warrior's army, armor. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul speaks of the breastplate of righteousness. This is a reference to the writings of Isaiah who said, He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Isaiah 59, 15 through 17. Isaiah's writing was a prophecy picturing our great King and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I can't help think, but think old Isaiah might have been thinking about how David rejected Saul's armor. When we last saw David, he had been anointed king by Samuel and entered the personal service of King Saul. Today's passage focuses on the contest between David and Goliath. Not many years could have passed between David's anointing and this narrative because he was still not old enough to be considered for service in Saul's army. Some Bible scholars put David's anointing at age 10 to 12 and his battle against Goliath at age 15 to 17. In those five intervening years, teenage David had gone from sitting in the field with sheep to facing down the most feared enemy in the land. <laughs> Growing up is indeed a tough situation. What are some ways you've witnessed teenagers revealing courage, confidence, or wisdom beyond their years? The teenage years are different for everyone, but rarely are they boring. Regardless of your family situation or your hometown, 
You change from a child into an adult in those years. As we consider David today, let's imagine ourselves in his shoes, knowing his eventual calling, struggling with respect from his family, serving a king with a tormenting spirit, all encompassed with the bravado and and still silliness that accompany normal teenage years. Jesse was a proud father, knowing his son would be king, but he probably prayed with all his might that the youngster would actually live to adulthood. Point one of today's lesson talks about the future king David arriving as an unlikely hero. Let's read together 1 Samuel 17, verses 16 through 17, verses 22 through 24, and then verses 32 through 33. We'll read them all together. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, and ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines, and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. In a standoff, the Philistine champion Goliath, a giant, challenged the Israelites for a one-on-one battle, yet no soldier was bold enough to answer. What are some, some reasons the people of God succumb to fear rather than step out with boldness? Well, I can think of a few. Uh, a lack of faith in God's strength and care, for instance. And sometimes leaders themselves display fear, which sets the tone for those who follow those leaders. And far too often, the situation is more than we think we can handle by ourselves. And when that happens, we learn we trust in ourselves rather than God. King Saul should have been leading his army in faith, but instead he needed to be encouraged by David, a young shepherd. David stepped up to fight Goliath, but first he would need to convince King Saul that he could handle this challenge. So who is this Goliath fellow anyway? Well, he was a man who stood nine feet, nine inches tall, while the average Israelite male was only five feet, six inches tall. In other words, the average Israelite military man stepping out on the battlefield would only be half the size of Goliath. And Goliath was equipped with metal armor and well weapons at a time when the Israelite soldiers did not have easy access to metal, and most had no armor at all, according to 1 Samuel 13, verses 19 through 22. Indeed, this was a fearful situation. Point two of our lesson talks about how the future king, David, trusts in the Lord for victory. Let's read again in 1 Samuel 17, verses 34 through 40. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. 
And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And as he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. So what happened here? David has quickly acknowledged that the Lord delivered him from lions and bears, so now he trusted the Lord to save him from Goliath. Thankful moment. What is one testimony you have of the Lord's deliverance in your life? How has he helped you? David trusted God to use the tools and skills he was used to. He didn't need to be or act like someone else. David needed to be the person the Lord had made him to be. David was confident in his abilities because he trusted the Lord, so he walked out with his five smooth stones and a sling. What would happen when this teenage boy stepped into the battle arena with the most feared warrior his people had ever known? Every eye was on David. Would he cave or would he shine under the pressure? Let's take a look at the weapon that he used, the sling. Our writer tells us that it was a long range weapon. Now today, when we think of long range weapon, weapons, we think of rifles that can shoot bullets a thousand, two thousand yards, hit a target and destroy it. So this so-called long-range weapon made from two braided cords of leather or animal sinew or cloth might be good for 30 or 40 feet at the most. Attached to one end of each cord was a piece of cloth, wool, or leather used to hold a stone about the size of a tennis ball. The sling was spun horizontally or vertically then one cord was released, ejecting the projectile. Upon impact, the stone could disarm weapons, break bones, cause a concussion, or even kill the target. It's a pretty deadly thing to use, but it did have many limitations. <clears throat> Henry Blackaby modern-day theologian, says this, The account of David and Goliath vividly pictures the source of the Christian's faith. It's not our own size. It's not our own strength. It's not our resources, but the power of Almighty God. In those five little stones, David selected one. God put all of God's power in that stone. He gave David all the power he needed to sling that stone at Goliath. And as accurate as David might have been on his own, God guided that missile right to the head of the giant. God, through David, did the work. Now we come to point three, where we see that the future King David wins the victory for his people. 
Let's read together now, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 through 51. David has come on to the battlefield and he stands before the Philistine and he said to him, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into Goliath's forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took Goliath's sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Even though Goliath was bigger and stronger and more experienced, David was confident in God's power to, and purpose to save David for his glory. This is a good place to consider essential doctrine number 56, the exaltation of Christ. Where the death of Christ was the ultimate example of his humiliation, the resurrection of Christ from the dead is the first and glorious example of Christ's exaltation. Christ was exalted when God raised him from the dead, and Christ was exalted when he ascended to the Father's right hand, and he will be exalted by all creation when he returns. All these aspects work together to magnify the glory and worth of Christ resulting in the praise of the glory of his grace in rescuing sinners. Consider David's victories and Jesus' victories and look and see what are some parallels you see between the two. When I look, I see an unexpected unconventional victory. David wasn't expected to kill Goliath and Jesus wasn't expected to, to defeat Satan. But both did their respective, both achieved their respective victories. And how? Both of them, David and Jesus, trusted God the Father to save. And then the final defeat of Goliath by David was when David cut his head off with Goliath's own sword. The weapon of Satan, the thing that was supposed to finish Jesus for good, was a cross on Calvary. And the cross on Calvary became the altar upon which Jesus sacrificed himself to atone for our sins. What a victory. And then David, very shortly thereafter, ascended to the throne as king of Israel. And someday soon, we don't know when, but someday, Jesus is going to return. And he's going to ascend to his throne in Jerusalem as king of the kingdom of heaven. 
All right, let's see if we can apply this lesson we've learned today. Because we've been forgiven through the power of the cross, we pursue the nations, not in judgment, but with the message of grace, that all may hear the good news and be swept up into the glorious love and grace of God. First of all, we have to understand, we have to have a head knowledge. The story of David and Goliath is not a call for believers in Christ to destroy our earthly enemies, but to remember, here's a spiritual application, but to remember that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, according to Paul the Apostle in Ephesians 6, 12. The battle is real, but we walk in the strength of the Lord in the full armor of God, the full armor of our God, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, God's word, and prayer. The world may ridicule our seemingly powerless armor, but we find comfort and confidence in the weapons God has provided us for resisting the devil and proclaiming the gospel. So what are you doing to equip yourself for the spiritual battles that come your way on earth? And then, of course, there has to be the heart application. Sometimes we feel alone in our battles, but that's what the prayers of the that's where the prayers of the saints lift us up. After expounding on the full armor of God, Paul wrote this, Pray also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth to proclaim the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Ephesians 6, 19-20 The Lord gives each of us fellow warriors to hold us up in prayer in speaking truth and in trusting him for the outcome. And related to that, I covet your prayers. Please do that for me every day. Where should you acknowledge your need for the prayers and help of others? Who, uh, what, what prayer, in other words, simply stated, what prayer request do you need to make known so that others can pray for you? And then, of course, the work of our hands. We need to apply the work of our hands. No one expects to wake up as a world-class athlete. It takes a lot of training and practice. In a like manner, we should not expect tomorrow to wake up as a warrior of the faith. This, too, takes time, commitment, and practice. Preparing for spiritual battle, battle takes combat training, and that can be done anywhere in the name of Christ to help a hurting child, to soothe a troubled attitude, to serve one who can't repay your kindness, or go out of your way to be kind. If you're not sure where to start, ask a pastor or a teacher. Ask a deacon in your church for a place to serve. The opportunities to build up our spiritual muscles are everywhere. So what opportunities will you have this week to trust God as you obey him? Dirk Phillips, who lived from 1504 to 1568, says this, Our spiritual David, Jesus Christ, in his divine righteousness has taken away our sin and slew death with his eternal life. That is the joyous gospel with which the Holy Spirit comforts all repentant and troubled hearts. Heavenly Father, lead us to serve you with gladness of heart, trusting you to bring us to victory in all things you call us to do. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, that's another lesson and another week gone by. Will you be here next week? Please come back and when you do, we'll study a, uh, we'll study some more about David, the faithful king. 
God promised David that future kings of Israel would come from his family and that his kingdom would endure forever. God fulfilled this promise by sending Jesus as one of David's descendants. All of history is driving toward the day when Jesus, the son of David, will be recognized as the king whose kingdom is without end. These lessons from the life and times of King David are often left to teach our, young, our children how to live like the brave shepherd boy David, trusting in God for all that will happen to them when they're grown up. But the deep spiritual truths we learn from David's story are truly important for us adults as well. Until we meet again, go with God. Walk where Jesus walked and tell some that Jesus saves.